I'm Jonah Dempsey, and this is the Frequencies Podcast. And I have a special guest, Craig Weinberg, today. Hi, Craig. Hi. How's it going, Jonah? Thank you so much for joining. Uh, Craig is the founder of Multisense Realism, and I've been a big fan. I want to say we connected like 10 years ago. I mean, it was it was a while. They're, they're going by. When did you? They're not making start... years like they used to. That's... Yeah, it's true. <laughs> they're not, yeah, they're not... <laughs> uh, when did you start doing multi-sense realism, or, or when was it first released to the public? I mean, so uh, I think 2012 was the the actual website, uh, the WordPress website. Um, I had been doing. I mean, I really feel like 2002 and three. I had already sort of been formulating things just arguing with people, debating with people online and like various. Well, it felt so fully things. formed. I mean, yeah, I would be surprised if there wasn't, you know, because I, I discovered, so uh, multi-sense realism, you describe it as cosmology of sense, a cosmology of sense. Yes. And, yeah. And I love that description. And I, I love philosophical discussions of ontology, cosmology. I love understanding sense and our reality and how reality is, whether through phenomenology, philosophy, or yeah. through um, neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience. I mean, yeah. I love all of it, social neuroscience. Um, and I, when I found your work, I think it was about 10 years ago, that first year, yeah. I was blown away. I mean, this was the most oh. well thought out, full featured, wow. kind of thought out and just and explained in ways that I can understand, really. I mean, I think that's well, a big part Well, of thanks it. so much. I appreciate it. You yeah. know, it's yeah. not, not many people get it, you know, um, it, it seems like those who do really, really like it. I've gotten a lot of, you know, compliments and stuff. And then everybody else is like a complete shutdown, you know. Uh, yeah, I, there there are these silos, and there can be silos <laughs> of the neuroscience Daniel Dennett people, or silos right. of uh, post structuralist philosopher people, or you know, there's all these sure. different silos, yeah. and they all have their own kind of complaints. And uh, I I just so I mean, for the viewers out there, this is a human design podcast. But one of the things I've wanted to do is get people that are outside of human design, but just doing really interesting work. Um, and of course, I'll be sharing your chart at, at some point too, which will be exciting cool, for viewers cool. who know human design, sure. but we can save that for later. Um, but I mean, this to me is really exciting work because it's tackling the hard problem of consciousness. It's tackling understanding the nature of reality and it's basically tackling almost, um, it's this whole, it's in human design, we, we say that it's not a universe, it's a biverse and that the biverse is kind of comprised of the world of relativism, the four Einsteinian, you know, relativistic yeah. dimensions, but also this whole other sort of um, these other dimensions, if we can call them that, which uh -huh. which come together to form our subjective experience. Right. And that's something that you've really tackled that a lot of people shy away from, and they kind of just keep it in the Einsteinian relativism and so on. But or I guess not relativism, uh, relativity, excuse me. I know they're very different things. <laughs> I have to be very precise with you know language here. But uh, in the sense that um, you, you're really like, can I just, let's just, let, let me show, should I show a graphic and you can kind of just talk? Uh, sure, about yeah, it absolutely. Okay, because I think that the, the other thing I love is that you're a very diagrammatic thinker. And <laughs> yeah. Maybe too much, but yeah. No, not too I, much I, for I me. Love, I love the visual stuff. I, I mean, mainly I, I do that because I want to see it myself, you know? It's yeah. like a lot of kind of concepts that I know intellectually come together, but I'm kind of juggling them in, and I just want to see it, you know? I, I love it too. And I love, um, in, in human design, most of the human design system came from a man named Ra Uruhu, and he famously didn't take notes for any of his talks, but he would create graphics. Mm -hmm. And each graphic he would then use as the kind of foundation of his, his topic. So I'm going to show one of your very first graphics I was able to nab off your website. Nice. And this oh, one, yeah. and then maybe I'll hand it over to you because I'd love to just, I, I, is this still basically where your thinking is at or is this kind of, I mean, these are the two sides I'm kind of talking about a little bit. This is it, Exactly. Yeah. That, that definitely is a, a, a biverse kind of uh, um, view of it. I mean, all I've really done since then is kind of fleshed it out. Uh, you, you know, it, I mean, part of what, the focus on sense um, and 
that was kind of a, the first breakthrough of, uh, I, I had come from kind of thinking of the universe in terms of patterns that, oh, you know, everything is patterns. Um, it's sort of like an information view of, of the cosmos um, that I had come through. I, you know, I'd come through kind of materialism and then, you know, sort of info centric models. And then, um, but I, so coming from this pattern, I, at some point I kind of had a breakthrough that pattern is dependent on pattern detection and, and uh, interpretation, you know, pattern recognition. So you can't really have one without the other. Uh, and, and so that's kind of where sense comes from. And, and I, the word is, can be kind of a problem for some people um, because sense can be used in different senses, right? And that's one of the senses of the word sense is this kind of using it as a, as a category in, in the sense of, right? Um, mm -hmm. Which figures in also, but, but in, 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 you know, in general, there's kind of sense and sense making. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I was a big, I'm, I'm into basic science. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to replace any observations um, but sometimes I'm reinterpreting our physical model. Um, but, you know, just, I, I'm trying to really go to the basics to just start from scratch as much as I can, but without leaving out, you know, the, the, the cornerstones. So, you know, I, like at this time, I, I, I put down here matter, energy, space, and time in the two diamonds. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, now, if, you, if you're really going to go more specifically in relativity, the M in E equals MC square is not matter, but mass. Um, so matter, mass and energy would both qualify some, something that something physical is doing. Um, you know, it, it's, it's really mass and energy are really boiled down to the geometry of how matter moves. And a lot of people are going to dispute that and say, oh, it doesn't have to be let matter, you know, it could be light, it could be, you know, something dark energy or whatever. But I kind of think that it might, that everything that we think isn't matter physically is actually just something we haven't quite explained about what matter is doing, mm -hmm. right? So it's, you, at the very least, you've got some material instrument that you're using. So, you know, anything that you're projecting as mat matter out there could just as easily be a phenomenon being generated by the matter of the very instrument that you're using. But anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, and I, right. well, I love that you're looking at, I mean, I love the word sense also, and I can understand how, I mean, I, I like, uh, I like to say philosophy begins when we stop asking what a word really means. Yeah. Because nice. instead, to communicate, we ask, what do you mean by it? What do I mean by it? How are you using right. this? And and so even um, just talking about how, like, yeah, there are patterns, but there's also the perception of the patterns. The perception is part of it. And I right. see that you have perception here on one side. Yeah. And, and it, I mean, it really is, um, it's so important. Yeah, I, I'd like to go deep into multi-sense realism for the viewers, and then maybe in a second part, we can do this in phases. I want to present a little of human design cosmology and get your cool, feedback yeah, on it. Absolutely. Because I know that this is a kind of an area I, I may have told you a little bit about, you know, we, we were on a dreams group, wasn't were we on like a dreams group for a while together? That was yeah, kind of yeah. Fun. yeah. Yeah. Are you still on that group? Do you ever go on there? Or? Yeah, I, that's a discord, right? It's a Discord, I'm pretty sure. And you know, I still read okay. it sometimes. I haven't posted a dream for a long time. I used to post yeah. them on there. It's a pretty good little group, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I, uh, I, I just watch. I don't contribute that much lately. It, it, I don't know, for me, it seems like Discords have a short life cycle that they, they have a burst and then not much for a long time. Yeah, they... there'll be some activity and then people just kind of move on to something else. It's hard to keep them really going. Yeah, yeah. But I, I love all that stuff. I love dreams and... Uh, you know, I mean, I, I initially came from, um, as a kid, grew up like really hard science, just science, you know, um, technology, science fiction and all that. And then sort of 
you know, later in the in the, the trippier years, you know, I got more into uh, numerology first because I was totally anti-astrology and I thought that is complete bullshit, um, mm-hmm. you know, but someone did numerology for me. I was, you know, 16 and I had never heard of that. This was a long time ago. It wasn't even a thing really that you heard about as a teenager, you know, whatever. Um, and I was just really impressed. I was I was just shocked because in my mind, I thought that it had to be, you know, it, I, it, I could tell that it was not nothing that, you know, mm-hmm. he, he laid out just straight from the book, a, a big a whole reading from my name and birth date. And I just, you know, because I'm kind of a weird person. And it was like, you're kind of a weird person, you know, it was, I mean, that, that it was just like, wow, you know, um, so how does it was, know I, yeah right right and, but there's the details the specifics and stuff was just really um kind of shocking to me you know um so i got into numerology for years I just I, I would do numerology charts of every person that i met basically anyone i was talking to i would just run it down and do their chart and i kept the charts and i would pour over them and i would make charts of charts you know of mm-hmm. or, or to, to really get a feel of of you know what the numbers are supposed to mean I and mean, it starts out like you know you look at a book and why oh yeah why does this you know i don't know why but five means constructive freedom you know six means uh, balance and love and responsibility you know but eventually after doing this for years i got to realize why the numbers mean what they do and mm-hmm. that was a big breakthrough and then and i started realizing that it really you can break it out so that I mean, in numerology, you're basically dealing with nine, just the nine digits, and then 11 and 22, Mm -hmm. 33. But um, you can take, so it's basically the first eight numbers, like an octave, you can fold that over. So it's just two sets of of four. And then nine is sort of the integration. Right. It's it's, plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four, minus one, minus two. Or, or, you know, it's it's kind of how it it moves. Yeah, or or it's like the inner four and then the outer four or whatever. Um, Yeah. And and that just, it was so simple. And I love the symmetry. It was so clear to me um, that uh, then I started entertaining other things. It's like, all right, well, maybe maybe astrology has something too, because it's based on that same kind of symmetry and all the things that, you know, the I Ching, the tarot cards, any kind of divination tool, it, you know, s- seems to come from that, some kind of a symmetry, a 12 fold, eight fold. Um, yeah. You know, same basic idea. Something that I've been really excited about lately and some viewers of my, of my channel, um, they joke, it's like, Oh, you know, Jonah has a new thing, but uh I've been doing Cards of Destiny, and it's also called Cards of the Magi or Love Cards, Cards of Truth. It has a few different names, but it's based on, it seems to be based on the playing cards. And you would think, well, that's funny. What do playing cards have to do with anything? And then you start looking at them and you realize these playing cards embed so much knowledge of the annual cycle. There's 52 cards. There's 52 weeks. There's four yep. suits, there's four seasons. Each suit has yep. three court cards, there's three months in each season. There's 13 cards per suit, 13 lunar months. And then some of the wild ones, the Joker was added at some point and came to take the spot value of 1.25 because it was the fifth, fourth kind of. Like if you think the first suit is a value of 25 and the second is 0.5 and then 0.75 and then one. And this all goes back to, to, to Al kind of alchemical studies as well. Yeah, really love, solved... love alchemical studies. Oh, yeah. And it really solved, yeah. I mean, even um, the axiom of Maria Prophetisa, where she says, uh, from one comes two, from two comes three, and out of the three comes one is the fourth. It's mm. a famous kind of a mm-hmm. riddle. Yeah, yeah. It's a riddle. Yeah. Well, in the cards, you kind of start with the one, which is fire, the hearts. Um, and then out of that comes two, duality, the principle of mind that can kind of divide and compare. And then out of uh, which is air, wind, and clubs, and then out, and it's kind of you know the seasons as well. Out of that comes the three, which is the diamonds, the earth principle, and then out of those first three together come one is the fourth, which is the water, which has a solid, uh, gaseous, and a liquid form, and all of these sort of deep. Oh, and then the, the coolest one, and this will be the last one I give you on the cards, but that if the Joker is one point two five, then it's kind of this extra value kind of tacked on it's kind of as this weird there's more reasons why they give it that value mystically but then you add up the spot value of every single card in the deck ace two three four you know up to 13 
Just one plus two plus three up to 13. Next suit, next suit, next suit. 364. Wow. And then you add the Joker, 365. And there you go. And there you go. Wow. So, I mean, that's nice. the kind of level of precision yep. of the numerology behind the cards. And Very um, cool. I've been digging into it. I've been doing card readings for people uh, just kind of for fun. But But like you, I got deep into numerology long before astrology. I couldn't believe that some pop culture pickup line, you know, back exactly. of a newspaper thing had yeah, any validity yeah. at all. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, no, newspaper horoscopes are, you know, I mean, not, not that, not that you can't use that as a, a you know, a kind of an Oracle or divination or whatever, just like you could use anything, but it's not, it doesn't have much to do with astrology well, at all. Well, yeah. And, and I, I hadn't realized at that time as a, as a teenager, but but similarly, I think I got uh, Florence Campbell, what the numbers say about you, or, or, you know, I've got your number, some kind of kitschy yeah, yeah, title. Yeah. I forget what it was. Right. But... My, my first one was called The Secrets of, of Numbers or The Secrets of the Numbers or something, which was okay. actually a great, a real, a great book. Um, I have that. I actually have it. I, oh, it's in the other I love that book. I would, I would bring it out. Yeah, it, it's really That's nice. That's a great a... intro Mm -hmm. numerology mm -hmm. yeah and then later uh just more recently i got deeply into chaldean numerology and i hadn't even realized right. there were different forms yeah. but the chaldean numerology there's some overlap there's some differences i think what we studied is the western typically numerology is pythagorean kind mm -hmm. of came out of the school of um, you know pythagoras and that's where you have master numbers 11 and 22 and things like that yeah, yeah. chaldean numerology i got into uh, a few months ago and it's kind of been, I mean, it's been on my radar for a while. I would look at it, but you know how it is when you're getting into something. It's like you really, it can be on your radar a while and then you have to kind of have an event where you go, okay, this is it. I'm going to spend the weekend. Let's see Wait. what this is about. Well, 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 human design is a little bit like that for me. I've, I've sure. had, you know, a couple encounters and sort of sniffed around and, um, but it's like, I'm so entrenched in numerology and astrology that it's, you know, I'm, I'm like converting it into that still. When right, I, right. And, and that's totally valid. And I think, um, I mean, I still love numerology. I love astrology. I, I love, I mean, these are kind of like different genres of music or different. Um, and, I mean, and, you know, when you really do see the beauty in one of those systems and you have that aha moment and you go, yep. wow, like you were saying, like when you really understand why five might represent freedom or, or how these, how these right. different like you, you feel like you've actually gotten to know uh something like the essence of that number and i i yeah. think that's also another reason i really like multi-sense realism is that you're not afraid to look at essences really right. or at you're kind of not yeah. afraid to engage with these what might be considered older philosophical debates sure uh, yeah so yeah it, well, and, and that sort of comes out of um that kind of before I, I had these kind of breakthroughs, the, I was just thinking in terms of patterns that, you know, it's just a more universal category that can accommodate matter and ideas and feelings, whatever, you know, patterns. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I and it's funny because it's really, it, it's sense, but it, it's also qualia. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and, and people have a lot of problems with that, with, with you know, I, I think that's sort of a, an ideological reprogramming that you have to do to actually take your own experience or what seems to you like your own experience seriously. Like, you know, most people would rather consider something like a quark or, uh, you know, dark energy as well physics physicists talk about that so that's definitely real you're going to be this person in your entire life but that's just some epiphenomenon or whatever you know it's and it's like well yeah really though <laughs> but there is something like a um i mean for lack of a better term spiritual development or for those who sure. don't want to use the term spiritual you could think of it as a psychological point of growth where a person reaches um the ability to sort of I mean, the, the, it happens again and again in different ways, but there is definitely a marker in a person's life where they kind of say, 
okay, I understand that there is little t truth, like truths, like facts, but sure. also what is what is the truth of my experience? Like you're saying, like, yeah, I'll believe that a quark is real. Why don't I believe that something that I'm experiencing has yeah. some validity, even if it's not fully explained or, or something like that? Yeah, so. yeah. And, and I think it just shows sort of how far we've come. Uh, you know, the pendulum has swung so far to the, the West, you know, over the last four or five centuries that uh i mean this is all new it, it's inconceivable the, the kind of normal worldview that the the western educated adult has now of uh you know i think it would be laughed out of any primitive culture like this kind of idea that well we don't really exist and all that really exists is things that we'll never perceive in any way and it, you know it's just concepts of particle waves in superposition and statistical, you know, probabilities collapsing and all this. And, and it's, yeah, I mean, that that's, that's a way of looking at a very narrow theme in some sense modalities of, of, of the universe, but it's a, you know, ultimately a dead end as far as the big picture goes, unless, and, unless you do strong yeah. emergence and just smuggle in everything and just say, oh, you know, it's well, it just shows, happens uh, or whatever. It, it shows how different a logical formula, which it could be a logical pattern, is from subjective experience. And I guess yeah. um, one interesting dichotomy that we examine in human design, and, you know, I call it human design uh, just because we're talking about usually in terms of the body graph and human experience. But a lot of people who are kind of older in human design just call it design because yeah. they really are just talking about, I mean, it's really um, in the in the original experience that the messenger of human design, Ra Uruhu, had, he had what was basically a mystical experience and human design was like one day of it. And the wow. rest of it was the design of forms and cosmology uh -huh. and how it all uh -huh. kind of worked and the crystals of consciousness and all this. And that's a really interesting discussion. But part of it was also looking at what we call circuitry in the human design body graph. And uh, there's a really big difference. Certain channels are called logic and others are abstract. And the term logic versus abstract in human design refer to logic is basically what's repeatable, what is a formula or a pattern. <laughs> And it right. tends to be validated through prediction that if the formula works, you can predict what will happen. If I do this, that outcome will happen in the future. Right. Abstract is making sense of what already happened in the past. It may have only hmm. happened once. It may right. be completely unique. And, and the thing is, people that have a lot of logic circuitry or versus abstract or exclusively tend to get in these great debates and they tend to each kind of claim the other. And the logic person says, no, it makes perfect sense. But it's like right. they have a formula that works, but there's actually no, they're not really able to make a story out of it. You end up with, right. you know, time running backwards and this right. is happening, yeah. and that's happening. You have no way of, but it works. It can send a sure. rocket to the moon. It just can't, yeah. you don't exactly. And the same with like AI now, we're having a hard time coming up with compelling stories about exactly how it works. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Um, on the other hand, you have uh, the people who really are great storytellers. And what you can be sure is that the points of the story are true because they're validated, factual. I mean, this person was here at this date, they went to there. But then the connective tissue kind of has to be filled in between the different points in the story. So it's kind of like they each have their limitations. Like logic can work, but can't necessarily tell a good story about why or how it works. The storytelling... Exactly can, you know, it can express some facts, but there's also a lot of connective tissue that fills in the blanks, which is right. kind of left up for interpretation, so to speak. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I mean, you know, when I, you know, like I was saying that I get a lot of resistance to people from people who don't don't want, you know, don't like multisense realism or don't get it. And it's always coming from that, you, you know, it's like there's nothing wrong with the, the logic of their objections it's the assumptions behind the logic that I'm, I'm addressing and they can't even see it. They can't, they can't get underneath. It's like the logic is a given. And I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, before logic comes sanity and before sanity comes experience, you know, before experience comes Absolutely. some kind of consciousness, you know, it's, a, a, but yeah, it's, it's some people well, aren't here for that. Point, was it Carl Sagan who said, uh, 
I, I forget if it was him or I, I almost thought it was Bucky Fuller, but I think it was Carl Sagan who said, um, you know, if you want to make an apple pie, you don't just need apples. You need to first build the universe. <laughs> so yes, exactly. Of, like, yeah. If you want to talk about logic, you first need a thing that understands what logic even is. Yeah. You need a story about how that thing got to be there. And... I, I, I had a catchphrase, uh, the universe has to make sense before we can make sense of it. Yes. Oh, I right. love that. That is a wonderful <laughs> slogan. Well, that's okay. This is a perfect place for a break. Let's end on the universe has to make sense before we can make sense of it. When we come back, uh, I want to hear in your own words a little bit about um, more about how you formed multi-sense realism or uh, how it emerged. Kind of maybe we can even look at your website and then uh, I have a couple things in store I want to share. So this has been cool. so exciting. <laughs> cool. Great first segment. So let's take a short break and we'll be back soon. Sounds good. Thank you. So I thought I can share, uh, I'm going to share some of your diagrams. Um, I just love diagrammatic thinking. I didn't even know that that was, that there was a name for it. I've just always loved diagrams. It always helps me to understand. And then I think it was the mid uh, 2010s. It was kind of a movement in neo-rationalism and some of these, you know, I was very deep in a philosophy kind of circle um, centered around the Global Center for Advanced Studies and the new Center for Research and Practice and uh, European Graduate School and these kind of organizations. And people like Fernando Zalamea and Reza Nagarastani and kind of neo-rationalist thinkers. And there was a real movement, uh, this was about eight or nine years ago now, towards diagrammatic thinking. And at, at that point, I really liked it because to me it was... Um, almost hearkening to a James Hillman kind of a thought where James Hillman says concepts are imprecise and really, you know, if you see a diagram, I mean, there are concepts, there are words, but you're seeing the relationship between the concepts. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's not that. just, right. And there's some precision to it. And, and yeah. so I'm just going to go ahead and share uh, one that I, I just found here and then maybe I'll, I'll hand it over and you can tell our viewers a little bit about it. So this is Syzygy. Right. Uh, nice, nice. Yeah, this is also uh, one of the earlier ones. That actually was a slide that I used. I, I, that was the first time I went to the Science of uh, Science of Consciousness conference, and um, which was, you know, I was just kind of flailing around online, talking to people, and I, trying to, I guess, get people to listen to my ideas and stuff. And I had sent sent something to david chalmers and he actually did respond and said yeah you know you should you should go to the science of consciousness conference or at that time it was toward a science of consciousness conference so that was 2012 and i you know it was a poster session i got approved for the a poster session I was, I was all excited and i didn't have a poster uh so i printed out all of these eight eight by ten you know eight and a half by eleven slides and i just covered the entire i mean you know total uh x files looking <laughs> menagerie of stuff uh but so this was one of those um and i used that symbol uh on for you know going forward for for different things on my cards and stuff mm -hmm. but so th the word syzygy has a history for me that goes back to at least 1991 um which parallels the word sense uh because syzygy it, you know if you don't know uh for people who don't haven't heard of that is uh it has a literal um sort of physical definition of where you'd have three celestial bodies in a row like in an eclipse you'd have sun moon and earth aligned would mm -hmm. be a syzygy um but it also has a you know psychological sense of uh coming from like jungian concepts of that you'd have the animus and the anima is is yoked together uh so that that's a syzygy you know this kind mm -hmm. of kind of like a con conjunctio almost or, exactly uh, exactly right yeah right, and, and and the the, the uh, yeah and so 
so you really have, I mean, that's part of what I loved about the word is the word itself is a syzygy, right? You could, how could you get more opposite than on the one thing you have an astronomical factual geometry, and then on the other, you have this very sort of esoteric, uh, you know, alchemical notions. So those are the two sides of syzygy that makes the syzygy of syzygy. <laughs> um, I love that, so, yeah. Uh, right? So, so, and sense is the same way. Sense can be uh, sense as in sensation, and it can be sense as in sense making, uh, or it can even be a third. It could be intuitive sense that you just sense something, and then all three of those are just sense in different senses. So sense is a syzygy, syzygy is sense, you know, it, um, but anyway, uh, yeah, so the diagram, I, I kind of superimposed the I Ching trigrams. Uh, I'm using the, the red on the black is the same trigram. I'm, I'm just, that's just purely that's, cosmetic. That's water, yeah. I, I recognize that one. Yeah, yeah, or the abyss. Uh, hmm. um, so I, I'm just really kind of shoehorning those in as best as I can. Uh, I mean, really, the, the center one, Xian, Jian, um, right? Heaven, heaven or the fully Yang? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the, the fully Yang, the 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 ideal, right? Um, so in between, I I I did just try to get it. I, I wasn't really trying to reflect the I Ching per se. I was I was trying to just really get that minimalistic sense of the symmetry of it that you have. You know, all fully uh, unified in the center. And then the the different permutations of how how you could you know integrate the 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 yin and the yang or the presence and the absence or however the 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 connected and the partially disconnected so you can have come up with these you know binary t trigrams um, so I'm using that just as kind of the canvas so I can contrast the same thing that we saw on the other side slide of matter versus energy. Um, but this time I'm doing it's more of a of a trinity, right? So it's you've got matter, time, and energy, and then versus space, motive, or you know sense, motive, and space. Um, but but you know just like how the colors go, you you can or, or like an ambiguous image, you know, like the a duck. Um, uh, That's also an old woman or something like that. Yeah. How you, yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I'm spacing on the duck. Um, I, I know what you mean. It's it's yeah. the sort of optical, you know, illusion where you see it's a, it's a rabbit. Yeah, it's a, a duck. Oh, it's duck a duck and a rabbit. rabbit. That's right. That's yeah, right. Yeah. And there's but, others yeah, that are like an old woman, yeah, exactly. but it's also uh, some other creature. Yeah, something. the profile. Yeah, right. So, yeah. so the, it works the same way that you can you can draw out. You know, it's kind of hypnotic, but you can look. Uh, like sometimes I'll look at this and I can see it as three sort of overlapping spotlights. Um, you know, the red, green, and blue. And they're overlapping into the CMYK, right? Um, mm -hmm. But you can, you know, you can kind of mix and match. You can, and I, I played with endless, uh, breaking them out, you know, into chunks. You could take the crescent out of one side or the other or whatever, and and it all it all makes its own special sense, you know. Mm -hmm. However, you want to put them together or or draw them apart or compare and contrast. But um, so in this one. You know the the it's, I'm I'm really showing like matter and space on the on the the western side the left mm -hmm. side but it's really the western side that's mm -hmm. important but um is that's kind of the most objectifying right matter and space you're just dealing with objects geometry and then so the east side I'm saying sense. And energy, um, it. I, I'm getting uh, by sense of there. I mean, kind of subjective sense. This, you know. Yeah. Well, and and you need time to create both space and sense. I like that. That if you just have matter, really, what space is is matter over time, <laughs> because it right. creates the space in some way. Like matter in time, you know, is going to create a spatial. Um, uh, yeah, I really like some of these some of these keynotes or some of these kind of ways of understanding thanks well, thanks. And it's, yeah, well, well, well yeah. i see time as kind of is it, especially in this pic 
diagram is that it, it really joins the two. If, if you're seeing it as two halves as like Western Eastern time really is, is the common it's, it's uncommon to both of them and it's common to both of them. So that, I mean, you could say like, if you just took matter and space, you could have a time, a, a, an instantaneous snapshot in theory or, you know, abstractly, you, you could mm -hmm. have an image in your mind of the solar system frozen and that's just, you know, objects in space or matter in space. Um, and then, but you really need some kind of a, 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 a frame of reference to connect that to time. Um, it, you know, and, and then later on that actually got into time scale, which became a really important and kind of overlooked thing in, in cosmology, I think. And, um, but anyway, so yeah, and so it, I've got sense and motive became kind of my dyad um, of, of the most essentialized skeletal idea of what sense is, that, that it's always participatory in some dimension, that there's, there's sense and motive. Um, and you could break it down like sense to motive to motor if, if you're dealing with physics. Mm. Um, you know, so... Uh, yeah, no, I, I love, well, I just love seeing, I mean, the thing is these keynotes are also, I mean, they're not that different from the keynotes in, in human design, which is interesting, which mm. which shows me that, the, see, there's this idea in human design. So Ra had this experience shortly after the supernova 1987A event, which was right. where Sandalik in 1987, the light from Sandalik, which had gone supernova 167,000 years prior, because it's 167,000 light years away, finally reached Earth. And for four days, we were all bathed in an, mm. an abundance of neutrinos. And one of the ideas, um, and shortly after then, Ra had his encounter, and one of his ideas was that basically the, the collective unconscious, what we could call Jung's collective unconscious, was basically seeded with certain knowledge and certain uh, basically information that is pre-verbal or pre-conceptual, but then has been conceptualized and expressed since then from different people who were alive during that time who basically yeah. got this information somehow. And it's a very interesting thing because we typically think of information transfer as you know, I might understand something and then I can convert it into words or convert it into a diagram or a combination of pictures and words and diagrams and things, or maybe even show you or kinesthetically, here's how you do it. Or So I'm transferring information to you somehow where then you understand it and then you have it internally and then you're able to transmit it to somebody else by externalizing. But right. it is interesting. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting idea of like, is the collective unconscious somehow capable of receiving and transmitting information in a way that it's then up to us to find a way to externalize. I don't really know. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, that was kind of another big breakthrough of uh, just talking about the collective unconscious that um, really sort of questioning the assumption of nothingness that and, and replacing it with kind of everythingness um for a lack of better word but but specifically not not in an abstract sense of you know everythingness but of a concrete reality of all experiences the totality of experience uh, mm -hmm. as an uh, essentially indivisible you know that's your particle that's you know that's all that there is and then well, and, and everything then that Right. And then when you're saying indivisible, I'm also thinking again, it's like your, what I like about your work and your thinking is you're not afraid to look at the continuous, the indivisible, the qualitative, something that is very challenging for a lot of science. Um, in fact, in a minute, I want to, I want to share something with you. Let's, let's continue this line of thought because I'd like to hear cool. like this, everythingness being this indivisible, um, but then I, I'd like to share, uh, I have something to share in a moment, which will be kind of exciting. Great, great. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, there's a concept 
called Smallism, um, which uh, I think Philip Goff brought that to my attention, but he, or reading, reading what he had written, um, but it came from someone else. But, you know, there's, it's almost a, considered a given. It's so deeply embedded in our kind of scientific worldview that, you know, larger things come from small things that if you, if you can get the, a good theory of, of the most primitive particle and the first second, the first, you know, nanos, nano, nano, nano second of, of the big bang or whatever, then you would explain everything. And, um, that there's really nothing behind that uh, other than our own kind of biases uh, as human beings as a, in the human experience. But for cosmology, it's really arbitrary. I mean, like I think about, you know, forget, forget life, forget planets, you know, going back, uh, you've got, um, uh, I just lost it. Hold on. Well, uh, but I see what you're saying that even like there's a belief that if we could, it's kind of like Laplace's demon, which says if you know the position of every atom in the universe, right. you can play it like a record or just, or like, you know, you just play it out and it'll play right. out the same way every time. And that's very much like what you were saying, where if you start with the Big Bang, the moment it occurred, yeah. when it's the size of a pea, then you could just predict the entire universe because it's simply. Right. Uh, right, right. The real outcome of that, and what you're saying is no, it's actually like it's an interesting idea with smallism is what it sounds like you're saying. You can start with a totality, exactly. And we sort of cleave little yeah. quantitative bits of it, and we say this is what this is what the totality really is. And it's like no, you've actually just kind of carved a little bit off of it. <laughs> it, it exactly, and, and why you know cosmologically, why isn't the totality just as primitive as any particle or you know instant that you could. That you could imagine it's it's the totality it's undivided it's you know before you start so then you know if you start from there then it makes sense that you can have these kind of you you go the other way you're not building for you don't have a nothing and then you're building things on top of it you have you know just this kind of crazed laboratory of eternal laboratory of genius of creating more and more experiences richer and richer experiences in and then messing with them by including limitations on that um, bubbles within bubbles of insensitivity so if the universe is made of sense experience or qualia or whatever um, you you can make more richer experiences by nesting insensitivity so just like you're you're born you know as a newborn baby it's like you're in this cocoon of amnesia uh or you know that's that's how i think i, th I think it no, might absolutely be i see what you're saying it's like if we start with a totality instead of trying to build from s smaller building blocks start with everything and then what you're calling these kind of areas of insensitivity are basically it's actually when we deprive ourselves of certain sense experiences or when we are yeah. deprived in various ways that we that then the smaller circle within this totality then becomes our totality and we're able to kind of zoom into it exactly. and experience that and what it really is is not that oh wow i'm having such a new experience new to us of course but it's more that i'm being deprived of other things which is making what i'm not deprived of that much richer exactly so, and and yeah. isn't that theme of you know that kind of deprivation and and abundance you know disconnectedness and reconnecting isn't that such a theme of all of sense experiences it's, it's like you know you can you if you get used to the air conditioning in your house you know one degree of difference between 72 and 73 degrees fahrenheit maybe it seems significant to you right because it, we're so spoiled you know in, mm -hmm. in our climate control um or if you're thirsty, how great does water taste if you're Absolutely. thirsty? Absolutely. You're really explaining. I mean, these are just as fundamental laws of the cosmos or in, you know, human design, we usually say laws of the Maya, just in kind mm. of, you know, yeah. hearkening to um, the sure, sure. Eastern idea of this all being this 
created reality experience. Well, I have something you're going to love, I think, I hope. Cool. Uh, sure. I'm gonna I'm gonna read it for a moment. So if you need to grab a glass of water or anything, I think it'll be like I'm gonna read like a page maybe. But I, cool. I want to get to the point. Um, this I mean you've said a couple of things and just in this last little bit uh, that are just so relevant. So this is Introduction to Metaphysics, 1903, Henri mm. Bergson, mm -hmm. and Bergson's one of my favorite favorites. Not many philosophers into Bergson anymore. Uh, Catherine Malibu still defends Bergson, and a, a few do, but. Um, you know, Bergson famously uh, had a public debate with with Einstein, where Bergson mm. it was kind of agreed lost that debate, and it mm. was really unfortunate because it set back Bergson's scholarship for quite some time. But um, in any case, so this is basically he starts. I'm going to summarize this, and then I'll kind of get to the good part. So he he summarizes saying that when we talk about metaphysics and and what he means by that is not like metaphysical like a metaphysical bookstore he just means ontology like classic ontological i mean i, I know you know this but for any viewers when he's talking about uh, metaphysics he means more in like the aristotle sense of what what is the nature of reality physics being the laws of gravity and the laws of motion and all these things and metaphysics being kind of what assumptions go into all of that and, uh, and he basically says that there are two kinds of knowledge. And the first is relative, or maybe said to stop at the relative. And the second is the absolute. And these are quite yeah. big terms that need some qualification. But I think, uh, yeah, I'm just going to read down to here. So it'll be like this section here. And this, I think you'll see that this is a familiar line of thought from how we've been, uh, been kind of going about it. So consider the movement of an object in space. My perception of the motion will vary with the point of view moving or stationary from which I observe it. You know, I have, um, you know, my sunglasses and my perception of them changes. Um, for this double reason, I call such motion relative. In the one case, as in the other, I'm placed outside the object itself. But when I speak of an absolute movement, I am attributing to the moving object an interior and so to speak states of mind. I also imply that I am in sympathy with those states that I insert myself in them by an effort of imagination. You know, what is it like to be these sunglasses? Or something like that? <laughs> right, right. Uh, then, according as the object is moving or stationary, as it adopts one movement or another, what I experience will vary. And what I experience will depend neither on the point of view I may take up, since I am inside the object itself, nor the symbols by which I may translate the motion, since I have rejected all translations in order to possess the original. In short, I shall no longer grasp the movement from without, remaining where I am, but from where it is, from within. I shall possess an absolute. Now, this next paragraph is the best one, but I just want to say really quick, he already kind of starts with something like what you talk about with the private-public distinction, mm -hmm. which, I, which I love. It's kind of like when, when you know, we're identified with these objects we call bodies, we're experiencing a private interior world, and then there's a public sort of expression of that. Uh, right. And that's the distinction you use. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And if you have any comments or I can continue on, uh, this is because this is really the, this paragraph is so good. This to me just summarizes a big part of Bergson's project. Cool. So consider a character whose adventures are related to me in a novel. The author may multiply the traits of his hero's character, may make him speak and act as much as he pleases, but all this can never be equivalent to the simple and indivisible feeling which I should experience if I were able for an instant to identify myself with the person of the hero himself. And that's kind of what you're talking about of like the indivisible, like once you get the totality of the character, I guess he goes on out of that indivisible feeling as from a spring, all the words, gestures and actions mm. of the man would appear to me to flow naturally. They would no longer be accidents, which added to the idea I'd already formed of the character continually enriched that idea without ever completing it. The character would be given to me all at once in its entirety. The thousand incidents which manifest it, instead of adding them to it, would seem, on the contrary, to detach themselves from it right. without ever exhausting or impoverishing its essence. So very much like what you were talking about with this uh, idea of kind of the starting starting with the totality, starting with the whole thing. Right. Right, right. You have this unimpoverishable essence. You can't exhaust it. What we can right. do is kind of... It seems like an, a spring, right? And all the things I'm yeah. told about the man with so many points of view, 
uh, all the traits which describe him, which can make him known to me only by comparisons with persons or things I already know, are signs by which he is expressed more or less symbolically. Symbols and points of view place me outside of him. They give me only what he has in common with others, not what belongs to him and to him alone. But that, which is kind of showing how we tend to compare and say, well, this is similar. I mean, it's even like what I was saying earlier, like logic versus abstract. Logic is the pattern which can tell you what all of these different instances have in common with each other. But right. when we talk about something unique that's only ever happened once, um, so yeah, so that which is properly himself, which constitutes his essence, cannot be perceived from without, being internal by definition, nor expressed by symbols, being incommensurable with everything else. It's not the same as anything else. Description, history, and analysis leave me in the relative. Coincidence with the person himself alone would give me the absolute. And it's just such a mm. funny approach, yeah. right? But I mean, this is very Dude, close. This there's is there's so ago. much. There, there's so much there. And, and I've even thought before, uh, you know, Deleuze wrote uh, Bergsonism, right? Yes. Yeah. It's a wonderful book. Yeah. Yeah. And um so I've and I have kind of vibed with what I've read of both Deleuze and Bergson, and, and yeah. thought of like ah you know uh, maybe I'll call I'll, I'll I'll do my manifesto and I'll call it Weinberg Weinbergsonism, <laughs> but yeah um, I like that yeah, yeah Weinberg. right <laughs> but uh but yeah so I mean you know and then the concept uh of the gestalt gestalt um mm -hmm. like the totality this kind of indivisible monad that is complete um and you, you know you talk about public versus private and if you kind of identify the the public end with like you were saying of kind of all of the ver the the particles that are like each other the 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 broken facts that you can put together in different combinations versus the private uh that would be more of the gestalt so i think of trying to kind of essentialize that that if you're moving towards the the unprecedented and creative and private and gestalt that is what i call adhesive you're going in the direction toward the totality you're you're looking for and you could say even religion you know relinking that you're you're trying to link back to the totality to the source whereas you know physics or math any kind of objectifying publicizing uh mode of sense is going to be you know what's the opposite of adhesive i say cohesive so you've got all these or, or convex versus concave, you know, you could go that way too. But so you've got, you know, are you looking at at Indra's net as from from outside as as mirrored bubbles, you know, reflecting each other, or are you the the bubble itself that doesn't the mirror is turned inward, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. uh, and and there is nothing else, um, literally. I mean, there and there's not even any nothing. So it's it's just the totality. It's all experience. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, you, I mean, you can find so many examples of it. I love light, of course. I mean, light is amazing for any of this type of stuff that if you look just again and again, come back to what a prism does, you know, that um, when you, you know, forgetting what you know about diffraction and that you're breaking this, you know, white, white ray of all mixtures of all wavelengths and everything. that's kind of a model that we're getting from using physical instruments that can't actually see as far as we know so so our whole model of light is a little bit you know is coming from this maximally biased physicalist place that we're not really looking at light we're looking at the tangible consequences associated with light while we're awake basically but you know we see, I see vivid colors when I dream and there's no wavelengths of physical light there at all, right? It's dark inside your skull, so uh, mm -hmm. not getting any wavelengths there. So where is this color coming from? And people say, oh, well, that's a memory or so doesn't matter. What You're looking at something. What are you looking at? You know, mm -hmm. what are you seeing? Um, you're not seeing neurons, right. <laughs> you know, and you're not seeing visible light. So, uh, mm -hmm. but, but anyway, you know, I noticed one time, if you really look at, if you're playing around with a prism and, and you're getting the, the bands, you know, 
everything sort of above above green to blue to violet and then everything below from yellow to orange to red that middle that we're saying i, I mean it, in a real prism if you look at it what's in the middle is it is just whatever you're looking at right it's 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 the light source itself so you could say it's white but white is really brightness it's really colorless brightness and colorless brightness is really visibility itself so it's you're it's really a you know a prism is just a piece of glass you're 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 looking at you know you're looking at your finger and you're it, it, you get that prism and you can see you know maybe a red finger an orange finger a yellow yeah. finger I have right? one right here. Yeah, here we go. I, I have my nice. little. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. So, you know, the middle of it is just the un, undiffracted totality. It's it's not really the, the the fact that it's like different wavelengths all put together is sort of beside the point. Um, it's uh, so it it's really it's not really white light. It's clear light that if it's sufficiently bright will look white because you're kind of blowing out your uh y you know your your retina your retina's sensitivity you're hitting the threshold of the sensitivity so it's you know like people have near death experience and you see the light you know i think of that as well yeah that's your your the limitations of your lifetime or whatever your your mortality coming up against the its own end right the, the absolute so it that's so in my theory if that was true then the the white light would be what you see before you see everything hmm. <laughs> right i love that, I love that. That's it's like you, you you lose your blindness you don't lose your sight the the sight mm -hmm. is everywhere um so while we're alive while we're mortal we're in all these nested envelopes these cocoons of various kinds of intensity and amnesia that compound well they kind of trade off because as a baby you've got you know it's all fresh and new but you've got this enormous sensitivity and then as you age you you get all of this you know entropy and neg entropy which going back to that slide that we looked at earlier with the black on the outside was entropy mm -hmm. and the middle was was significance oh oh sorry um, the other slide you mean the uh yeah yeah i i think the... i put entropy on there too entropy and significance oh I yeah think i, was I on, see it there but you're that. talking about it works uh, i can i can share it, back um it, yeah, it's okay that that one's good too you know it's um but so this idea of significance was a big deal to me uh that is sort of a hegelian flavor really of that if if sense is the thesis right if everything is sense experience everything is you know qualia basically um then the insensitivity is the antithesis right and so the synthesis is what i would call significance that's what you know you go through this deprivation and then that reconnection you get this rush of you know it's what i call aesthetic saturation which is i'm intending that to be literal whereas normally you would have an experience where you have highs and lows spread out over time over space um with aesthetic saturation or significance what you're doing is you're squeezing out all of the blank space you're squeezing out all of the gaps so it's you know like in a symbol or in an intense you know profound a mystical experience or you know near-death experience or dream significant dream whatever it's just really high significance the uh, it's aesthetically you know astonishing you, uh this idea of awe like why is why is an appreciation of the universe always inevitably kind of connected with this awe even if it's your full-on science you know carl sagan it's like he's just dripping with awe and every billions and billion you know but his awe is toward that cohesive the multiplicity the cardinality of just the vastness of it all on the micro and the macro well, but you I, can I go think... the yeah. Right, you're saying, and then more on the mystical side is for the adhesive going towards. Yeah, the, and you exactly. know, I'm, I'm also kind of reminded of Kant. I mean, it's not exactly the same thing, but the sublime uh, mm. versus the beautiful, where the sublime something like uh, mm. 
an atom bomb might be sublime going off, you know, because it's just the sublime terror. Of yes, just yes, sure. Absolute, you know, the, the magnitude of it or something like that. But it's certainly right. not yeah. beautiful and that we might see beauty right. in a single flower coming out of the sidewalk or something like that. I, I, absolutely. And that's why, you know, if you want to get into kind of theology and the problem of evil, that's where I get, you know, my hope hope is that well after you die you know you you see it in an, an absolute context so that it doesn't uh, that basically the universe is not trying to make it only beautiful it's always going to be more and more beautiful and more horrible and terrifying um you know it because of that deprivation the 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 dialectic you know thing it it's horrible while you're experiencing it because you're only in a bubble, you know, you're, you're not getting the big picture. You don't know how boring it is to exist for eternity. So, you know, <laughs> you have no, it's unfathomable to you, but you'll get it. You know, when, when I'm thinking, you know, that maybe that's what happens. You die, your, your constraints are dissolved and you're back to where you've always, always been. And everyone has always, always been, um, and you're ready to go back for another round because, you know, it gets boring. If, mm -hmm. You know, there's no sense of time or scale. It's like a billion years is a fraction well, of a second. And there's something, uh, there's the Australian mystic Barry Long. And I think we should take a short break here. And then when we come back, I'd oh. like to show you some of what he says. But he... Cool. Um, he had a really interesting point where he kind of talks about good news versus bad news and how from yeah. our short lifespan, you know, com comparatively short, rather, we see, oh, it's good news. And then there's bad news and there's good news. There's bad news. And we're, we're hoping that we don't get more bad news and we're hoping we don't get more good news. And he said from the perspective of, he says, basically the energy that we call energy is neither created nor lost. It's simply, you know, transformed. And that's like the good news, bad news. What he calls real energy, he says, currently in our cosmos, the only way to produce real energy is through living and dying. And at the moment of death, mm. since new real energy is produced, which is added to the totality. And it's the total life experience of that particular life. And that from that perspective, from the perspective of real energy, the only real truth at this higher capital T truth level is that all is for the greater good because every sure. bit of energy contributed contributes something of the experience. So of course it's really callous to kind of say that what they call, I guess what they call spiritual bypassing and, you know, sure. and kids and stuff. And like, we have to understand. <laughs> yes. We're speaking at different levels here from the level of our life. Yeah. There really is bad. There really is. Absolutely. Bad. But from it doesn't get any more real than that. I mean, that's, right. that's the thing is, you know, yeah. real suffering, um, you know, once you're mortal or incarnated or whatever, there's no way out. You know, you, you got to, I mean, it, it, it is, can be, it there's no true. limit to how bad it could be all practically well, you know, and, other than uh, that it I ends have, eventually. I have a good friend who had a sort of mystical vision some years back where, cause he does these deep meditations and kind of goes into fully experiencing things and he experienced what it was like being a newborn baby. And then mm. later in the same experience, he experienced what it was like being the mother whose baby had just died. And he wow. was overwhelmed yeah. by the deepest sadness yeah. and grief. And he kind of asked, what world would create a world yeah. where infants die? You oh know? yeah, well, 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 I mean, I think just even on the face of it, just animal life, um, if you don't photosynthesize, you are killing and eating other organisms every day. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's that's the that's no, your anti. That's to get into the game, man. You're a killer <laughs> yeah. right away. Um, well, that's right. just and, unbelievable. And it's interesting that part of his experience of being the newborn baby was almost like the ultimate. We could almost call it like a narcissistic omnipotence feeling of nothing really matters. It's all just a game. It's all enjoyable. Yeah. Then the second part of that experience was no, this is more real than real is real. It's yeah. like the kind of the other half of it is like, you yeah, can't well, just have I, I've been there. Of, it's all just a game, man. Tell that to the mother grieving her. her oh, yeah. kid. Well, I, I've been there. Yeah. And that's kind of what happened prior to really constellating multisense realism and stuff is, is my own experiences with kind of, you know, losing my shit and, and coming back. And, and it was exactly that. It was, were you getting so manic over days that you know you get to sort of identify identifying with the godhead you know when you're walking around in a basically full-blown 
you know, Kundalini awakening or psychotic, mm -hmm. you know, uh, episode or whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. but you're totally fearless and it's totally, you know, you're not, you're out of your mind. I mean, um, but mm -hmm. you're maximally adhesive. You're, you're totally self-actualized. Right. And then you go back to the cohesive pole. And, 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 then, <laughs> and then, you know, you drop like a rock um, and you yeah. can't, you know, uh, the other side of that um, is so humbling and mm -hmm. so so much grief and so much shame just the shame you know ah. how what a idiot what you know I, you know mm. it, well i i think let's take a, qu a quick break and i want to sure. show our viewers your chart and then i want to share a little something from barry long this has just been absolutely fantastic though and i'd love oh, to I'm so glad your experience Thanks. as well so uh, yeah we'll just take a short break and we will be back momentarily oh great For those viewers at home, make sure to check out multisensorealism.com. Multisensorealism, it's just all one word. And uh, this is with my guest, Craig Weinberg. So thank you again, Craig. This has been so much fun. My pleasure. Thanks for having so, me. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and share your chart because uh, we keep getting, I keep getting so excited just talking about all of the aspects of multisense realism and different connections to things I've studied or this, you know, I, I, I if I don't show your chart now, I'm not going to. <laughs> it's great. So, um, yeah, and I guess we could talk maybe a little bit. I, I'm not going to do too much chart analysis. It's more just for people at home who are human design students and so on and things that they're interested in. And, you know, there's people at home now going, aha, I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> are, are those colors the colors or it's well just these colors the um, are actually not the standard colors that are used okay. typically it would be the black and the red this is from right. a website called humanarchetypes.com um, normally the conscious is in black kind of customary okay. and the unconscious is red I don't okay. necessarily know uh, the significance of the colors black and red because uh, okay, I love these, I like these colors. I'm like right yeah, away. Yeah, like, oh, I mean, they yeah, do a yeah. great job with it. It's That's definitely significant jam. that they are different colors, but it's also um, this website has opted not to uh, to color the centers when they're activated or when they're defined. Rather, it colors them like this one is purely conscious, so it shows it completely in the purple, and then this one's purely unconscious. So like this is kind of interesting, like you have conscious activation in your Ajna center, so you kind of know what you know, but then you have unconsciously defined throat, so what you say is just going to be, it's like you're unconscious, like you you can't really plan what to say, it's just going to come yeah. out, it's just going to come out, <laughs> right. you know, more or less, more or less. I'm being a little mm -hmm. bit facetious, but that's kind of... Uh, mm -hmm one aspect of it. But yeah, I mean, I guess just a th the few things that jump out to me, 6124 is a deeply mystical and a very incredible mm -hmm. channel that is um, really, yeah, it's, a, I mean, it's, it's, this is your unconscious son, 612. Let me actually read a little bit of it to you. Cool. I have my uh, rave I Ching line companion here. So awesome. basically, you know, these are the lines of the I Ching. So you can obviously read, um, sort of Chinese interpretations, but this is this is more updated and relevant uh, in the context of the body graph, because obviously um, it was different back then. So 61.2, this is your design sun. And so this is really the idea of the conscious and the unconscious, the, or the personality and the design, is kind of that we cohabitate uh, the same form with this other intelligence that we're actually not even necessarily um, aware of. I mean, we become aware of it, but we become aware of it through, right? So you'll see that like these planetary placements, like, okay, you have moon in Virgo, you have Mercury in Aries, um, and so on. Like you'll recognize you have sun in Aries. You'll yeah. recognize the astrological import of, right. of some of this, but then the unconscious will be pretty much foreign to you because in astrology, we don't look at the unconscious imprint. According to human design, the unconscious is imprinted 88 days before birth. 
Yeah. Basically, the imprinting at the time of birth is a combination of of the planetary positions of where they are and the planetary positions one Mercury cycle, uh, roughly, or or 88 degrees of the sun before. And there's a whole deep reason for that. But what it really means is that everyone is pretty much in a square relationship, two degrees off exact square, to their unconscious. So hmm. we are kind of odd, ve- odd bedfellows with our unconscious. But if I had to read, if I read like 51.6 to you, you might be like, oh, that's me. That's totally me. That's a very part of Aries. I'm definitely an Aries that connects to Aries. It makes a lot of sense. When I read hmm. the unconscious, you might begrudgingly accept, okay, I guess that's also me. That's just the part of me that happens automatically that I have no conscious access to. It's like this other thing inside of me that just comes out kind of on its mm. own. Mm-hmm. Autonomous with its own volition, with its own sort of, like um, I think it was Tom Wolfe, the the uh, writer who said, well, being a writer, you're always contending with this, this other fellow who has to be there in order for you to write. And I show up to work every day, but that lout, sometimes he's late, some days he never shows up. You know? Sure, so. right, right. Yes, I, I, I can relate. <laughs> yeah, so, but just as an example, your unconscious son is the line of natural brilliance. Uh, it's gate 61, which is a deeply mystical, 61 is called inner truth. And inner mm. truth is like, it's very deep. It's, it's, I mean, it's not, it's not knowing that can be uh, even shared necessarily. <laughs> like it's knowing yeah, well, that it can be very yeah. difficult to share. It has to be shared some yeah. other way. But uh, so the second line is um, a gift for inspiration that is both attractive and beneficial to others. Here is somebody that is automatically putting out this projection that they know and that their knowing is inspiring (laughs) for others. Natural brilliance. If what they know does not lead others in the sense that it's inspiring for them or merely acts as a role model of inspiration, they begin to suffer from the fact that they can't live up to others' expectations about themselves. And they begin to wonder who they are and why is that anyway? And and, um, so there are a lot of very brilliant people in the scientific community who have really a knowing in which they are obsessed with the fact that that knowing will come to some kind of fruition, that it deserves recognition, that mm. somebody has to see it. Uh, but the brilliance here is the readiness to release their knowing, their mystery. They are projecting out that they know, and due to that, others can ask what they know, and then they can share some of their in- in- uh, inspiration. So there you go. Yeah, but I mean, that's um, why I'm here. <laughs> yeah, and it's a very, it's a very occult, very interesting uh, line. And then, of course, this is so. The other interesting thing is you're on the same incarnation cross as Ra Uruhu. He was born a day before you. He was wow. a five one, and so the lines move in sequence. So fifty one one, fifty one two, fifty one three. You're born uh. on the sixth line. So fifty one five, that was his, was the day before, and so so he was born. Um, you know, he's a fifty one five. Fifty one is the gate of shock. And so 51s mm. often go through a lot of shocks. <laughs> right at the end of the last segment, you were saying that you've kind of been through the ringer yes. of uh, yes. and, and, and getting some shocks yourself. And that is not uncommon at all for 51s. I mean, you can kind of imagine Ra's biggest shock of all was when he had this encounter with the voice that brought him the human design system, essentially, or the, the underpinnings of it. And, uh, you know, that was one of the most shocking things that ever happened in his life. Mm. Wow. So, um, yeah, 51-6. Uh, so is, is this out of 64 total? Is it like a There are 64 hex- hexagram? hexagrams. Yeah, 64 okay. gates, as we call them, the 64 hexagrams. Okay. Uh, you can kind of see they're in a wheel. Uh, cool. This was our uh, catalog last year for the conference that we put on. But... Um, you can find, yeah, and I, I can say, oh, actually, I have it behind me here. This is this is the wheel, and so Excellent. basically, um, but uh, I guess, yeah, here I can I can stop sharing that for a second, so you can see it a little bit larger, because it is worth seeing, and that you will I see the familiar yeah. astrological uh, signs. Nice. But yeah. then there's also the hexagrams of the I Ching, and so knowing Fantastic. astrology, um, you can say, okay, I know a lot about Capricorns, what they're like. Well, 
it's interesting to look at these hexagrams. 10 is very well behaved. It's called treading on the tail of the tiger, and it's all about not stepping on the tails of tigers. Well, Capricorns know how to be formal. They know how to be well behaved. That's 58. Bend the knee. Right. It has a lot of energy to improve things. 38 is like the fighter, not in the Aries sense of, but like the more like long term fighter, like fighting for yeah. purpose. Uh, and so on. 54 is the gate of ambition. And so Capricorns can be very ambitious. Um, there's 61, which is the one we were just talking about, about inner truth, which is kind of an interesting one. We don't normally think of Capricorns as being so mystical, but they are. It's kind of like the wizened wizard. Bowie sword. was a Capricorn? Who was? David Bowie. Oh, absolutely. And he had that yeah. long-term ambition. And yeah, and then 60 is the gate of limitation. And we know that Capricorns put up with a lot of limitations. So, yes. Uh, but, you know, you can kind of do that for any of the signs. And some of them are more mysterious than others. Like you might think, um, why are many of the splenic gates in Libra, for instance? Or some of them are more obvious, like the gates of Gemini are in the throat. Okay, mm -hmm. well, that makes sense. The throat center being related to, to Mercury and Gemini and so on. But, right. Um, well, I think of, I, oh, okay. I think of a lot of, uh, like, astrology and numerology as along the lines of cooking or wine tasting in, in the sense that, uh, you know, you can get really esoteric. Um, some things are, are obvious, but when you mix them together, you get new tones that are unexpected like you wouldn't you know sounds weird that you would drink a wine that tastes like asphalt or something but it it just if it has a tiny note of asphalt in a larger tapestry mm -hmm. you know then yeah that's going to really be interesting um absolutely so yeah there is a bouquet effect or a, an entourage yeah. effect as they've talked about um nice so yeah and so 6124 this is an incredible channel uh, I, I won't spend too much time on this because I, I, I know uh, this will probably be our last segment and I'd love to have you back on soon and we can dig into more of it and I, I have a few other things I want to cover. But um, I can definitely see that, yeah, you have a very mystical mind that is thinking about things other people haven't thought about. 1762 is very detailed and so good at expressing detailed opinions that actually are very intricate and actually get it's not like you're just kind of saying these generalities in fact you're doing the opposite of generalization you're taking all these generalizations other people have made and said and saying well let's actually look at these things what, what you know you're making a generalization by saying there's a pattern there let's look at what goes into even observing the pattern let's get more specific let's get more precise sure. very, very logical, very precise approach. Um, I'm I'm a specialized generalist, or or a <laughs> specialist yeah. in the specialty of generality. <laughs> yeah, and then you and I have uh, some commonalities as well in our charts. I have the forty six twenty nine. Um, which is is just very experiential and about making discoveries and yeah I won't give you a, a full reading for now but uh, I'll just say that you have a really cool chart and maybe um, when I put this on YouTube some of our viewers may want to comment or uh, cool. I would kind of welcome them to make any connections of things that they've noticed things we've talked about uh, I noticed your son is exalted which we try not to make a big deal about exaltations and detriments because you know um, oh, like here you have a, a detriment. That's what that down arrow means uh, because yeah. of Mars is actually um, Mars is in gate 24, which is detrimenting the 61 here. And so, you know, it's not a big deal. Everyone has most everyone has exaltations right. and detriments. But when your personality sun is exalted, it is kind of a nice like it just means that. Uh, you know, it's very fixed on one side of the binary that your personality sun is going to tend to exemplify what most people would consider the positive qualities of this line more than the negative. But cool. not that we want to make too big of a deal out, out of that. But uh, right. okay, well, I want to just show a couple things and uh, thanks. Let's go. Cool. Yeah, yeah. And so a few things I want to show Barry Long. Before we do that, I, I definitely have on my list. I've wanted to. Um, to show you a little bit of what we call base theory. And I think we'll have to save the discussion of this for next time. I'd love to have you back on. And in the meantime, I can send you some of these materials if you if you get interested. Uh, 
like we were saying earlier, you know, it kind of has to be the right time and place. And I, I never push human design on anyone. I, 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 in fact, the opposite. People have to pull it out of me, really. <laughs> uh, when I was first into it, the first year, I was like, this is great. Everyone needs to learn it. And then after that, I'm like, there are already people learning it. And the people learning it, they can ask me and we can talk. <laughs> okay, okay. But at the same time, cool. I mean, you would be an incredible boon to human design research. Cool, sure. It, it is so new and you have such an incredible mind and with the work you've done. And so this is a very... Um, deep kind of, uh, you know, this, I'm, I'm not going to go into all of these keynotes, but I will give the five minute version of just what we're looking at. Okay. So there are four dimensions of relativity. And it's interesting. I know that you put matter and time and kind of there, they are their own dichotomy, of course, but for the sake of Einsteinian relativity, we can consider time, even if it is this kind of special case, we can consider it as a dimension. It is considered as a dimension. So we have sure. sort of four dimensions. But then um, basically in human design, we have this idea that it's a biverse and the biverse is basically split between this the sort of reality that uh, is measurable and so on that we're talking about, um, the kind of relativity reality, and then the five dimensions of base. And the term dimensions in this case I like to think of them, um, I like to think that we're basically sitting in the cockpit. Our subjective reality is what is called space in human design. Now, this might mean something different than what we think of as space, because obviously in your diagram, we put space on the Western side, and that's kind of the more typical understanding. But this is more, when you see the keynotes, space is form, form is illusion. Illusion is hearing, hearing is music, music is freedom. Very weird set of keynotes oh, wow. in the yeah. sense more just that, that there's an acoustic phenomenon of being in a space. And if you think about it as the cockpit of the subjective reality that <laughs> we're basically sitting in this cockpit. And in fact, there's a, let me see if I can find, uh, there's another graphic that I'll just pull up here. I should have had it ready because it's the base graphic. And it shows their relationship to each other. And space is right in the middle. So yeah. let me just, uh, yeah, here we go. I can, uh, let me just share that really quick. And um, so here's my base theory notes. And we can see like in, in this one, um, I guess it's over here. So on the right side of this, um, the design base is a little bit different. Let me see if I can find one that just, oh, here we go. Oh. Uh, let's see if I can make this any bigger. It's not going to let me. Well, that's okay. Um, so let me see if I can find a bigger one. As you can see, there's a lot of interesting graphics in yeah. this theory. And it gets very, very deep. And most people in human design never really study this. Uh, here, I'm just going to share just this one graphic. But uh, it is something that is very rich and very rewarding. And so, okay. So this is basically showing that in the middle we have space. This is kind of like our cockpit where we're experiencing reality from. Like I'm in the cockpit of my mind or right. what I would call my mind. But really it's not really because interestingly, mind is more like when I'm in a reverie for memory. That's like Proust, when Proust goes into like remembrance of things past, he goes so fully into his memory and he's so fully in his mind memory of what's happened and what he knows and so on that he's actually not even present. Space hmm. is more like presence. It's almost maybe more like a buzzing insect, just kind of <laughs> present in the now. You know, it's like Eckhart Tolle and in, in being in the now. But <laughs> meanwhile, there's also the dimension of what we would call being. And that's like you start feeling hungry. Pretty soon you're pulled out of your reverie of the mind. You can't even be present. You go over and you sudden, suddenly start to have this hunger or, but you know, you see they connect. Like the mind can remember that meal. And they can right. remember that amazing feeling sure. it had. But they're kind of different dimensions in a way. Mm -hmm. Well, then over here, you have pure movement. This is like the whirling dervish who loses all presence of the room they're in. They lose all memory of what even their name is. They don't mm -hmm. notice if their body is hungry. Or this is like the athlete or the dancer or somebody mm -hmm. who's in a pure movement where they're simply in the dance. Maybe they're a F1 race car driver. Everything mm -hmm. else goes away. They don't even have time to think. They don't have time to remember. They are connected to the body. 
the body and being is connected to movement. Mm -hmm. And then design is one of the most interesting ones because this is really the inner um, the design is basically what creates our dreams, what creates our visions, mm -hmm. what creates our entire visionary world. Like you were saying earlier about how can, how is it I can have a dream? There's no light in my skull, but I'm experiencing light. Well, that's being designed. There's a designer, there's an unconscious there. Mm -hmm. And so there are kind of, there are certain mutually exclusive ones like, like the body is mutually exclusive from the design and which is kind of weird we might think of them as similar in certain ways but really it's well if you, it, if you think about being in a dream you know or a coma or something that you can't you may not be able to find your body exactly that's exactly yeah. right that's exactly right and the personality is here in the middle and it can more or less go into any of those so, um, and then what the other interesting part of it, I'm just going to go back to this other, um, this last one we had, we have keynotes where we look at what base a person is. And for instance, your base one, oh, you're only 1% base one. So you could be base five or you could be base one. Cause if you were born, base changes very quickly. Um, and if you were born like a couple minutes earlier, you would be base five. So, but you would either... So basically, base um, both relates at the macrocosmic level to the nature of reality, and we have these dimensions and dimensional keynotes. Also, it relates to even something like a personality, which is kind of an unusual way to look at it, but it's almost like uh, certain ones, certain people are representatives of different bases. So for instance, I'm a representative of the mind, and these keynotes very much relate to how you can tell how much I'm really living my design or living my purpose in the world or not. And a very deep aspects of who I am and kind of characteristics of who I am. And the, the furthermore, base is the only thing that doesn't change lifetime after lifetime. So if you ever get into reincarnation research, you can kind of cross reference if you think you might've been like a historically notable figure, do they have the same base as you? Because it's a core part that never changes. So I'll start with yours. If you're base one, which you're literally a few seconds into base one, because mm. it, I, it tells me what percentage in it is. Base yeah. changes every seven minutes. You're at 1% okay. into base one. So you're like so much on the cusp. On the cusp. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. But base one people, I actually could believe you could be base one because base one in the old days, base one had it a lot easier. This is the double yang. And basically all it wants to do is discover something new. And so mm. in the old days, it was very easy because the whole world hadn't been mapped. So That's base right. one would just leave, go over yeah. the hill to where people yeah. hadn't been. <laughs> and yeah. then they found something new and they put their name on it. You know, they kind of defined it and they, right. it's all about defining. And mm. so their individually is act, individuality is activity. It's very much about being individual. Um, and then you have these interesting keynotes where what they're basically here to do is to have a lot of yang activity to reach the limitations or even surpass those limitations, gain the perspective from that, and ultimately have a relation. And these are very deep keynotes. I won't I won't go into them so much for this one, but but basically there's this whole like kind of life trajectory of the base one person where each life they're kind of doing the same thing in each new era. And what they're trying to do is find something new, something that's never been found before. They're trying to go somewhere that's never been gone before. They're trying uh -huh. to, what base one people tend to get into these days is finding like micro genres of music and like little <laughs> things like nobody, like they get it, they're like, they're into like vaporwave before it was vaporwave or they're oh. into, you know, weird little genres. Now base five is very different. And I could also see base five for you because so much of your study and research has to do with subjectivity and with perception. Oh. Now, I mean, I guess perception is also, um, well, perspective is here, but basically base five people, they tend to love what I've noticed. This is not, don't, you know, quote me on this, but they tend to love like Enya kind of music, like music mm. that like takes you on a journey and creates this whole mm. like fantasy space. Mm. And they, they really, the, um, the keynote for them is that if they're really living their design, they have a strong personality, almost like a TV personality or a celebrity. If not, they're very forgettable. They're the people that blend in with the space. So people are like, 
was he at the party? I don't remember if he was even there because they kind of tend to um, just seem like part of the space that they're in. You know, they kind of just have, so personality is type. What this means is almost like the girl next door type, the the singer type, the, you know what I mean? There's like a, the bad oh, boy. boy with the motorcycle type. Like there's a certain type that people right. then start to fantasize about. Fantasy yeah. is where we get subjectivity. And then weirdly, subjectivity is rhythm and rhythm is timing. I mean, these keynotes go very, very deep. And this is like this is like one of those posters you want to just like print out and just like yeah. study in the bathroom wall because it's, right. it's some very deep, uh, deep stuff. But uh, I'll just tell you mine really briefly. Oh, so just but just off the bat, do you do you connect to either the double yang or the sort of this one doesn't have any combination of yin or yang. It's actually, this is like double yang, yang yin, double yin, yin yang. And then this one has no yin or yang. It's really just wow. space itself. So as a principle, do either of those connect? Yeah, well, well, I mean, I definitely resonate. You know, I have, astrology wise, I have just loaded eighth house at Aries, Sun, North Node, Saturn, Mercury, Venus, and Chiron. Um, all in Aries in the eighth house. Uh, and then numerology wise, I've got a one, uh, one destiny or life path and a right. one. So motivation. one being very Yang definitely connects. Yeah. So, so, you know, so that's, that's a big part of it is, is yeah. Going into the unknown, um, which is really not so much something that I would choose to want to do, but it, it's driven by kind of a repulsion against uh, the the world you know <laughs> against yeah. no that the, makes this that's a stage lot of, of the world that makes yeah. sense as as base one and also just that base one defines things and so much of what your work is doing is defining totally. yeah and, yeah uh, yeah so so yeah i mean i would say that um i i do i mean you know the other half is i've got a lot of you know uh, virgo first house virgo rising moon and virgo rising uranus and pluto and virgo in the first um and then new uh, numerology wise uh, seven expression so similar also you know you get that kind of blending into the background like uh um uh, mm -hmm. you know the 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 sabbatical the seven the uh, withdraw withdrawn uh you know being kind of shy and um innocuous whatever i, I you know i mean i'm not i you know, I, I, sure, generally... I, I see what you're saying that the space also connects. Well, and the other interesting thing is the personality and the design are always exactly one off because of the mathematics mm -hmm. of how they're calculated with, with the 88 degrees. So mm -hmm. if you have a base one personality, you automatically have a base five design or unconscious. Mm -hmm. If you have a base five personality, you automatically have a base four and so on. Um, I, I won't spend too much time on this uh, because I want to show you one more thing, and I think what this is really just showing me is that we just need to make this a regular thing. I hope you'll agree to come. <laughs> sure. Back. Well, I, I'm. I don't know what to do next. You know, I've written all the the stuff that I think I want to write, or at least for now. Um, so I'm just. Well, let's to just start going what, through it. I mean, let's next. let's revisit yeah. it, and we can just kind of pick different sure. things each time. And uh, I I love your work. I'm so interested in it. And uh, I will send you some of this human design material after in case you're just sitting around and you have a Great. long weekend yeah. and you want to, uh, yes. you know, dig in because it's certainly a really incredible um, system. But what I was going to show you, uh, just let me. OK, so two things. Uh, this will be really quick. One is Arthur M. Young. Have you ever seen this guy? Do you know this guy? I have not. Okay, he's a really interesting one. I'm not going to spend much time on this one either, but I definitely recommend checking out his Rosetta Stone. Um, for those in human design, also, this looks very much like Ra's graphic that he has um, showing basically the fractal lines going out from the center and the kind of, mm -hmm. you know, the four uh, faces, the four sides, which turn into these different faces and so on. And uh, this, this one might be a little bit... So people have taken this. I think Arthur M. Young himself did where he's actually made this the astrological signs. So Aries is spontaneous act and acceleration. Mm -hmm. Taurus is mass control and establishment. Gemini is power and knowledge. Cancer is velocity and change, which is interesting because you're like, how does that work? But velocity, mm. when you're at a steady rate of velocity, sure. it's about maintaining. It's like when you're on a train, right. you don't really notice it's moving and you know, cancer is right, right. comfortable with that. 
Leo is force and being. Which well, well right. I mean, velocity is a type of stillness. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Which cancer, if you think of it like home, and kind of where you're comfortable, yes, yes. maintaining constant velocity. You're, you're not accelerating, you're not decelerating. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, yeah, Leo, we have force and being. Virgo, we have work and fact. Uh, Libra's position, observation. And, you know, these are the mathematical formulas for these kind of fundamental mathematical nice. operations. And, uh, yeah, and it's pretty interesting to see uh, Very cool. Scorpio's transformation. Capricorn is control, you know. <laughs> sure, sure. So that was one. And then uh, let me show one other thing. And, um, oh, yeah. So this was just more relevant to what we were talking about earlier. And I'll have to post some of these links in the YouTube description for people to check out. So this is Barry Long, and uh, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this so we can maybe wrap up, but he has a really interesting, he's the one I mentioned earlier who talked about um, real energy and the difference and so on, and he just has this really beautiful, first he starts this whole essay, this is the Draconic Transverse, uh, I guess it's a chapter from his book, and I have a copy of this book, the whole book is really interesting, The Origins of Man and the Universe, but he basically says, um, there's different kinds of truth. There's like the little t truths we've been talking about. Then there's the truth that only myth can really convey. And that when you understand the truth behind a myth, that can kind of hit deeper in a way and you can understand it more. And, he's, nice. and the myth that he describes is the myth of Draco. And he mm -hmm. says that basically uh, the myth of Draco is the dragon with its head is yang, its tail is yin. The profound cosmic principle of yang and yin is the mythical bridge between outer and inner. And so I just mm. wanted to kind of make this connection with the conversations of public and private or relative mm -hmm. and absolute or however we want to look at it. The yang is behind the apparent external created by looking out consciously into the unconscious streaming down to the surface of earth. No idea what that means, but that's a very interesting mm. idea. I guess he means mm. the entropy or the chaos out there. I don't really know. Mm. But then yin is the unconscious within. And then he says this that Yang is the huge platform of celestial perception from this vantage point deepest and deepest space. The Yang principle of Draco presides over time and events on earth represented by life and death. From the earth's viewpoint, Draco's tail, Yin, ends deep in the unconscious of the human mind beyond the psyche, <clears throat> within the mind of the earth, the mm. mind of the one earth spirit. Very poetic. I mean, oh, this wow. is like yeah. so deep. And then this is the line, and then I'll, I'll kind of finish this part, but he just says, between the head and space and the tail within is the serpent's body. This is man and all species, both living and dead. So just what a what an image, right? That yeah. there's some continuum between this like external reality and then like the tail is like deep within the collective unconscious of the uh, of the earth, basically. So. Right, and and does that map to the north and south node? Uh, yeah, uh, Rahu and Ketu. I mean, they are traditionally yeah. called that, and I do I do yeah. think. Um, that would be an interesting way to look at that. I mean, we, we do say oftentimes the North Node is the trajectory in life we're oriented at. So if we're oriented kind of coming from within to without to kind of right. unfold our inner nature out into the world in some way, then it does poetically fit. So Nice. Well, yeah. Um, there's a, a, few, a few years ago, I came across a woman online who does astrology uh, and a lot on the nodes um i think her, she went by astralada l-a-d-a but uh she really had a a really powerful take on the nodes or or has you know they're they're up there um she did youtubes but i had not thought about it. she had a whole kind of character um connotation of of the nodes that it you know because i had always thought about yeah you know the north node is your trajectory and it's sort of where you're going in this life and the south node is where she, but she didn't seem to go by that very much but she talked about more in as like the head of the dragon is this kind of like a crazy energy uh, um of uh yeah hmm. you know hunger kind of it and the the tail is sort of more banal which um which i look at you know i mean it kind of makes sense both ways that if if the the tail end the south node is sort of what you come in with as an inheritance that this is the area whatever house is it's coming up in in your chart is sort of what is sort of oddly easy for you right it's like mm -hmm. no big deal um whereas the north node is where the heat is that's like 
you know, you're too much, you're, you're too interested. It's, it's what's too interesting to you in your chart, you know? Mm, um, I like that. This sort of excess or this, that's too much to handle yeah. almost. Too hot yeah, to handle. yeah. 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 Like um, but, but yeah, if you ever check her, uh, check her stuff out sometime. Astrolada, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, this has just been so wonderful. I hate to even wrap up because oh, I sure. have other tabs open I wanted to go and do and other things right, I want right. to talk to you about. But we'll have to do this again soon. And uh, I would love to just keep this conversation going. And I'm, I'm so glad this is our first time really talking. Um, we've been online friends for so long and I've been such a huge yep. fan of you and your oh, work. Well, thanks. And and we've mutual, had a yes. friendship of letters. And so it's nice to <laughs> connect yeah. uh, in this way. And of course, if you ever find yourself in Santa Fe, you're always welcome. I have a, oh, thank you. a big place here. We call it the center for human design. I actually pledged my home to be the center for human design. And we have guest rooms and have visiting wow. scholars and people like that. And, um, and so uh, I guess the other thing is I'm trying to dig it up. I, I swear I have it and I should just have it in my wallet, but I have this card you made me uh, yeah. and I yeah. got to find it. It's uh it's like a spiritual ID card. Yeah. And I just love that. I got to Did you have yours on you? Is that something? Uh, I, I, I keep it here. Uh, I, okay. Um, I so mean, maybe next it, time you can show it, yours or maybe it's I'll a have very it small group. There's only like, I want to say, you know, eight people at the most that that have them um, i feel so lucky that i have myself one my then. wife it was just so a brief lucky window. that i received one um but but i i would have kept making them but i ran into a problem with the uh, sort of the intellectual rights to some of the the sacred geometry type of stuff that oh, i happen to put yeah. on there and well, it was you can't kind of, copyright spiritual development. That's, you know? That was my position, but apparently <laughs> yeah. that's not one that everyone shares. And so uh, it sort of turned me off to the whole thing. And I was like, well, you know, I don't know what I'm supposed to do then, but whatever. I like them. I, I, I think they're cool. Yeah, um, they're really wonderful. So I'm going to try to find mine and dig it up. Thanks. I saw it not, not terribly long ago. I mean, I, I have it. I think it's in – I have like a collection of art things. And I think I just put it there. <laughs> cool. But I really should just keep it in my wallet. I think I was afraid I would lose it or something. But I, I, I have before and lately I just keep it at, at home on my uh, – yeah. I have kind of an alchemy table with all kinds of objects and things on there. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> Well, um, I would love uh, to do this again and also meet in person if you ever find yourself in the great Southwest. Uh, I, I, might. I used to live out there in uh, Pagosa Springs, Colorado. Oh, wonderful. I love it up there. Yeah, uh, yeah, I get it. Colorado's great. So uh, wonderful. Well, um, thanks again for being on. And for the viewers, make sure to check out Craig Weinberg's work, multisensorealism.com. Lots of great diagrams on there. And uh you know, you're a pretty approachable guy, so I don't think it's uh, too much to say that if somebody really is having their mind blown, they can reach out to you on Facebook. Absolutely. Say, absolutely. Yeah. So. Facebook. I, I, I'm always arguing, debating with people on Twitter. Uh, I well, that's their loss. You know, you have Quora. seventeen. You have seventeen sixty two, which is uh, you, people should not debate with you because you have the details. So <laughs> right, it's the yes, gate of opinions that, and the gate of is... details coming together to <laughs> nice, um, and it's very logical. So it's very very hard to win that one. So <laughs> right. well, wonderful. Well, well thanks again. Thanks. For thanks so much and, for having uh, me. Absolutely. Until next time. So thank you. Thanks, Jonah.